If you're a Roman emperor, you're the most powerful person in your entire world. Why on earth would you give it up? Depending on where you are in the empire, the ratio differs. So uh, in Italy, for example, in some places it could be one in three people being slaves. That's a lot of individuals you have to keep down at the bottom of society at the point of a sword. I'm Spartacus! No, I'm Spartacus! My name is Dr Simon Elliott, FSA. I'm an archaeologist, historian and broadcaster and today I'll be answering Google's most popular questions about the Roman Republic. First question. Oh, when was the Roman Republic? So when we talk about the world of Rome, we talk about three specific phases. The Republic and then two phases of empire which are the Principate and the Dominate. Um, and our focus here is on the Republic, the first third. This lasts from 509 BC, when the Roman Senate overthrew Tarquin the Proud, the last Roman king, all the way through to 27 BC, when the Senate declare Augustus, or rather Octavian, as Augustus, the first emperor. Next question. Who ruled the Roman Republic? Roman society was very, very stratified. So at the very bottom you had slaves and then you had freed men who had formerly been slaves uh, and then you had free men who had never been slaves. And then above that you have three classes of aristocrats. You have curials who are low-level aristocrats, leading merchants, military men. You have the equestrians, the knights, and then finally at the very top you have the senate. Of that, only the senate and the senators were patricians, everybody else were plebs. From the Senate, you have two individuals who are voted each year to be the leading men of Rome to run the Roman Republic, and they're the consuls. How healthy were people in the Roman Republic? That is an absolutely fantastic question. So the average lifespan for somebody living in the Roman world, the average lifespan was about 35 years. However, you have to take into account that incorporates horrendous levels of infant mortality. But even then, most people had a much shorter lifespan than they would in the world in which we live today. Because you were living in an age before modern medicine when they themselves didn't have a real understanding of especially social illnesses which are sort of transmitted between other human beings, especially in the urban environment. And the Romans also, by the way, had an amazing transport network which made it very easy for social illnesses to travel throughout the empire as well. So you have plague event after plague event after plague event. And because the Romans didn't understand this, they basically thought it was associated with magic. And the way that they dealt with it was also through magic. So they would have amulets which they thought would protect you from a social illness. Believe that an individual, so me, I looking at an individual in front of me can actually, through the evil eye, make them ill or ill-favoured or unlucky. So to counter that, what you do is you have your own eyes as countermeasures fighting back and that is why you very often find on the aegis of a Roman suit of armour, a muscle cuirass, a Medusa head, because the Medusa's got snakes with loads of eyes. That's why when you go around Pompeii or Ostia Antica, you can find wall paintings or mosaics featuring peacocks, because peacocks have got eyes on their feathers. It's all about countering the evil eye. So basically the Romans didn't have a very good understanding of social illness, and therefore, compared to us, very unhealthy. One final point most people don't realise is also Romans suffered greatly from eye infections. We know this from the huge number of eye ointment pots which have been found on archaeological sites. The reason being, of course, that um, it's a very dusty environment and actually if you're in the built environment, an urban setting, it's very noxious with open fires and things like that. So not a healthy place to live. How big was the Roman Republic? That is a very good question because it's like a chronological layer cake. So we begin uh, at 509 BC with the foundation of the Roman Republic. When at, at that time, Rome was basically when Rome was one of the dominant cities in Latium, which is on the central west coast of the main peninsula of Italy, um, around where the River Tiber is. Uh, and Rome was just one of the dominant cities there. In actual fact, the last Roman king actually was an Etrusco Roman king, because at that point, the Latium in the world of Rome was dominated by the Etruscans who lived to their north in Etruria, modern Tuscany. So it's a very small area. Um, and it's over a period of time that Republican Rome, through martial success, and by the way, they didn't always win. They didn't always win, but when they 
lost, they learned from it and came back the better. They kept coming back and coming back. So you have a series of wars at the end of which they're dominating Italy and then they're dominating Sicily. Then they find themselves in conflict with the Hellenistic world and then they start dominating the Balkans and then are dragged into the, the Near East and the Levant. Around this period also end up fighting a series of wars, the Punic Wars against the Carthaginians in the Western Mediterranean as well. And then that drags them through southern Gaul, southern France, and then Spain, North Africa. So you begin with this little kernel, tiny sort of um, place, um, the, the, the small growing city in Latium in 509 BC, and then over hundreds of years, gradually through this chronological layer cake, the Roman Republic gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. By the time Octavian, as Augustus is declared the first emperor in 27 BC, the Roman Republic is actually grown to this vast area where it's covering huge tracts of land. So from that point, you're looking at Gaul after Caesar's conquests, Spain after the defeat of the Carthaginians, um, in the Punic Wars and later the Spaniards, North Africa, Egypt, the Near East, Anatolia and the Balkans as well. So from small beginnings to a huge empire at the beginning of the empire. How did the Roman Republic expand? Well, the Roman Republic expanded through military conquest, pure and simple. Fighting a series of uh, campaigns over hundreds of years against people across their known world. The key crucial engagements would have been against the Carthaginians in the Western Mediterranean, the Hellenistic kingdoms in the Eastern Mediterranean, the Gauls and the Germans in Gaul. Remember Caesar also briefly, very, very briefly in fact, came to Britain in 55 and 54 BC and then against the Numidians in, in North Africa as well. So through military conquest. Next question. Did the Roman Republic have gladiators? Absolutely, the Roman Republic did have gladiators. So the use of gladiators originated in the Republican Roman world. And in actual fact, it originated almost certainly in Etruria, so the region of modern Tuscany, um, where it was associated originally with funeral games for a, a senior individual who died in the society. So you'd have gladiatorial combats as a way of celebrating their life and to entertain the funeral crowds. The Romans being very sanguineous and bloody in their own right and liking a good fight, actually pinched the idea because they were very good at pinching other people's ideas. And then it became a central focus and feature of uh, Roman public life, uh, ultimately in amphitheaters like the enormous Colosseum in Rome. Who were the Roman Republic's biggest rivals? Um, the Roman Republic's biggest rivals, in order, I'll give you the top three in my opinion. The Roman Republic's biggest rival was Carthage, against whom the Romans fought three very, very, very bloody, serious conflicts, first, second, and third Punic Wars. Next, I would say, any combination of the Hellenistic kingdoms in the Eastern Mediterranean, whether this is Macedonia, whether this is the Seleucid Kingdom, whether this is Ptolemaic Egypt. And then finally, probably, you're looking at the Gauls because Caesar, although he actually did conquer Gaul in probably around six years, uh, he found it very difficult and actually kept, kept having to go back to ter territory he'd already conquered because the Gauls who had acquiesced to Roman rule then rebelled. So in that order, Carthaginians, Hellenistic kingdoms, the Gauls. What was the triumvirate? The triumvirate, or the most important uh, triumvirate, uh, was in the middle of the 50s BC, which was formed by the three big men of Rome at the time. So you have the leading Optimates, who's Pompey, you have the leading Popularis, the Caesar, who's in the middle of his conquest of Gaul at the time. And then you have the richest man in the Roman world, Crassus. And these form this pact within the Senate that they won't oppose each other's legislation and they'll support each other. And it brings a degree of political stability into the late Republican Roman world, uh, which for a time actually stabilised things. But ultimately, of course, because Caesar became so successful in conquering Gaul, it set him against his great rival Pompey. And then ultimately you end up with the Roman uh, civil wars, which end up with Augustus being the last man standing as Octavian and the first emperor. So the triumvirate was this um, three individuals who worked together for Roman stability in the middle of the 50s BC. Moving on to the next question. What were the Punic Wars? The Punic Wars were the three conflicts which the Roman Republic fought against the Carthaginians. The best known is the Second Punic War, because it's in the Second Punic War, we have this great military figure, Hannibal, who is one of the greatest opponents as an individual that the Roman Republic or even later empire ever faced. And Hannibal, in actual fact, invaded Italy and then fought three 
victorious battles against the Republican Romans, the Battle of the Trebia, the Battle of uh, Lake Trasimene, and then the Battle of Cana. And Cana was a catastrophic defeat for the Roman Republic. They lost thousands and thousands and thousands of troops. But, but it's very insightful here because in that defeat you can see a real nugget about why the Roman Republic and later Empire was so successful in the Romans being so good at learning from the mistakes, number one. So they lost this battle, uh, but they picked up lots of ideas from the Carthaginians. Number two though, they also displayed true grit in that they would never give in. The Romans would go into a conflict, they knew what they had to do to win the war, and even if they kept losing battle after battle after battle, they came back until they won the war, which they did, of course, in the Second Punic War, which broke the back of um, Carthaginian power in the Western Mediterranean, Hannibal's final defeat, to die drunk in Anatolia. So the two things to take out from this are, number one, the Roman Republic uh, was very good at learning from its mistakes in battle, and number two, it never gave in, and that made them the most dangerous opponents anybody could face in this period anywhere in their world. Did the Roman Republic fight against elephants? Absolutely. So the Roman Republic fought a number of conflicts uh, against opponents who used war elephants. So these are elephants who are trained for conflict and combat. It's very difficult to do, by the way, because elephants are very bright animals. And to make them uh, battle hardened meant that they had to be really, really, really well trained because it seriously goes against the nature of the elephant. And very often the elephant turns out to be a bigger danger to their own side if they panic in battle than to their opponents. So the Romans themselves, although occasionally they used elephants, didn't make them a core component of their military capability. However, Pyrrhus of Epirus, who was a Hellenistic ruler from modern Albania, uh, he brought war elephants to fight the Romans in the Pyrrhic Wars. The Romans certainly fought against elephants when they were fighting the Carthaginian Wars and the Punic Wars, because the Carthaginians used elephants. And also the Numidians, who were allies of Carthaginians and later of Caesar's Optimates opponents during Caesar's civil wars when he fought in North Africa, they also used elephants. Caesar, one of the greatest military commanders of all time, and I would argue, and it's a very, very contentious argument, that actually he was the greatest uh, military leader in the ancient world, even in my opinion, greater than Alexander the Great, could have used war elephants, chose not to, because he didn't trust them. How did Caesar get his name? So Caesar had the classic trinomen of a Roman uh, senator, but the real, a real top end patrician with three names. Gaius, which was his first name, Julius, which was his clan name, and then finally Caesar, the cognomen, which is effectively a nickname. And you tend to find the eldest son in a Roman aristocratic family has the same name as the father. So Caesar was the eldest son, so had the same name as his father and so on, going all the way back through to the Second Punic War. So that's when Caesar first appears. One theory is this, that Caesar's forebear, Gaius Julius Caesar, fighting against Hannibal's elephants, allegedly, single-handedly, killed an elephant, perhaps at the Battle of Zama in 202 BC. It was a big deal, actually, and it made him famous in his own world. Now, the Punic Phoenician, the Punic name for elephant is Kaiser. So Caesar is a Latinization of Kaiser. So what we're saying potentially is Gaius Julius Elephant. The real beauty there is that the word Caesar in our world has in the past 200 years been used as a name for a ruler. So you have the Tsar in um, Russia or the Balkans. Of course, in uh, Imperial Germany, you had the Kaiser. So Kaiser to Caesar to Kaiser. So Kaiser William II potentially might mean Elephant William II. Was Spartacus a real person? I'm Spartacus! I'm Spartacus! I'm Spartacus! I'm Spartacus! I'm Spartacus! No, I'm Spartacus! No, I'm Spartacus! Spartacus was a real person, so actually I think it's a fantastic movie for a start, and as entertainment it's brilliant. Spartacus led the third Servile Revolt. Remember, at the bottom of Roman society you have slaves. Depending on where you are in the empire, um, 
the ratio differs. So uh, in Italy, for example, in some places it could be one in three people being slaves. That's a lot of individuals you have to keep down at the bottom of society at the point of a sword. In other places it could be one in ten like Egypt. But in Rome, in, in Italy, it could be up to one in three. That's quite dangerous actually. So the Romans were terrified of slave revolts and in the first century BC they had a couple and the key one was the Spartan slave revolt, the third one. The most important thing actually about the Spartan slave revolt, uh, the third Serbar war, was the key figures in the Roman Republic who were engaged with it. So you get the first mentions uh, in many places of Julius Caesar as a young man. Uh, Crassus of course is the figure played by Laurence Olivier in the movie Spartacus as the, the, the big leader. This is Crassus becoming the, sort of the big man of Rome etc and lots of people in between as well. So Spartacus was real. The movie is a great prism simply because it gives you this flavour, a very good flavour actually, a very late Republican Rome and the machinations in the Senate between the Optimates and the Populares. Next question. How did elections work in the Roman Republic? Well, the Romans themselves would say within the Republic that they were democratic. Of course, they weren't democratic because only a certain uh, number of people could vote, uh, the rich people. Increasingly, as the Republic went on, though, more and more people actually argue the case that they should be allowed to vote and more and more of the plebeians were allowed to vote. So ultimately, elections were pretty similar to the elections that we have today, where it was basically one person, one vote, just with the pool of people voting increasing over time. One of the really beautiful things that we also find in the, the archaeological record, in this case in the Roman built environment, is actually evidence of the democratic process taking place in the Roman Republic and Empire, but the Republic as well. So when people were standing for office all the way through Roman society, whether it's at the very top as consul or all the way down, you find evidence on walls in built up areas of people actually uh, advertising themselves as the candidate. So effectively the equivalent of a, a modern day political poster saying vote for me. So it's all there for us to go and see actually. And that's what I love about the whole thing about Roman democracy, that you can see threads which pull all the way through back from the Roman world to the world in which we live in today. How did Julius Caesar come to power? It's a great question. Caesar was effectively, despite coming from the senatorial class, Given how far he came in life, he was a self-made man who had this innate sense of self-belief that he was going to make it. And you can almost look at any stage of his career that he's picked out a route along what's called the Cursus Honorum, the career path of a Roman senator, from a young man to becoming a consul if they're that fortunate. You can see Caesar picking and choosing the roles along that path to actually maximise his ability to, to, to be the big man, as it were. Caesar, above all, was the leading late Republican warlord. So these are individuals at the very top of Roman society who've got a big enough following and enough money, Caesar borrowed all his money by the way, to um, create their own legions and then fight their own battles and ultimately fight their way to power. And for Caesar, um, he was really helped here. The reason why he was the greatest of them is because he was fantastic at military strategy and also tactics and personally very brave as well. So when he needed to, he'd actually fight on the front line. The thing which gave him the springboard to go to become the senior figure in Rome actually was his conquest of Gaul between 58 and 52 BC, which included his two incursions into Britain in 55 and 54 BC, because that basically made him the most important Roman in terms of their achievements in his world. Got the backup of all his Optimates opponents, spun him through into the civil wars against um, the Optimates led by Pompey. Battle of Pharsalus, Pompey's defeated, goes to Egypt, gets beheaded on landing in Egypt, and then Caesar fights campaigns in North Africa and then in Spain, and ultimately by 45 BC, uh, back in Rome, dictator, declares himself dictator for life, assassinated in 44 BC. So basically, how did Julius Caesar come to power? The actual answer is at the point of the sword. Next question. Was Julius Caesar better than Pompey? Yes, next, only joking, um, but the answer is yes. Julius Caesar was better than Pompey because in my opinion, he was a better military leader, both at a strategic level, at a tactical level, and uh, at a personal bravery level. And ultimately, actually the real reason why Caesar actually was able to get his shot at power was because when he returned to Rome after his conquest of Gaul, having been told not to bring troops with him, but he brought troops with him, Pompey could have stayed in Rome, actually, arguably could have stayed in Rome and found some way of countering Caesar's arrival, but he didn't. He chose to leave, uh, and that gave Caesar the field, the battle space, as it were, in Rome, 
to play with in Rome and therefore he could begin his bid for power. And from that point, Pompey until he loses the Battle of Pharsalus is always playing catch up. Our next question is, what were the optimates and popularis? Well, actually, that's a really, really important question if you want to understand the whole dynamic of the Roman Republic and especially how the Roman Republic came to an end. So these are the two main political parties, classes at the very top end of Roman society. So the Optimates were the pro-Senate party, they were the reactionary party, and the Populares were the radical party. And you can look at various key leaders throughout uh, Roman Republican history and actually thread them through each of these particular parties as leaders or key figures. So for example, Sulla, was a leading optimati and Pompey, the great Pompey Magnus, was also leading optimates, whereas Julius Caesar or Marius were leading populares. This becomes very important in the first century BC because this is when you have a series of very, very bloody civil wars taking place where you effectively have warlords, uh, Republican leaders, senatorial class leaders who are warlords because they can raise their own legions and then fight battles on behalf of the Optimates or Populares. Think about the Battle of Pharsalus between um, Julius Caesar and Pompey as an example. So Optimates were the reactionaries, Populares were the radicals. Why did the Roman Republic end? The Roman Republic effectively died a natural death really because in the first century BC you have this endless cycle of civil wars where you have these leading Roman leaders, I call them warlords, with their own armies fighting each other for power and sometimes the Optimates winning, sometimes the Populares winning. Um, but it spirals and spirals and spirals and then you have Caesar assassinated and then ultimately you had the final standoff between the last people standing, who is Caesar's deputy Mark Antony and uh, Cleopatra, against Octavian, who fight the Battle of Actium. And after the Battle of Actium, the only person left standing as a, a successful military leader is Octavian. And by 27 BC, the Senate has acknowledged that he's brought a degree of stability, which the Roman world now quite likes. And so he's basically declared, you're the boss, effectively an emperor, and the Roman Empire comes into being. So the, the Roman Republic effectively dies a natural death. Why did Julius Caesar change the calendar? Why did Julius Caesar change the calendar? Well, the calendar in use in the Roman world to the point when Caesar became the leading figure in the Roman world was out of sync with the lunar calendar effectively. That's basically the answer. And Caesar therefore decided that he'd reform things. In actual fact, that's no surprise because Julius Caesar was one of these highly ambitious individuals. If you gave him the opportunity to actually make his name doing anything, then he'd do it. So you give given the opportunity to change the calendar, which actually is going to change the lives of everybody in their known world. It's a big deal and he loves it. So actually the real reason is for two reasons. One, a practical reason, uh, brings everything much more into sync, not totally by the way, but much more into sync with the lunar calendar. And then finally, of course, by adding additional months, Caesar is able to make his own name as well. It's the PR. Why was Julius Caesar assassinated? Julius Caesar was assassinated because he effectively, by his actions, made it clear that he had contempt for much of the senior, many of the senior members in the Roman world, whether it's the Senate or Equestrians or others. He declared himself dictator for life. The Roman Republic, through to its very core until this point, absolutely loathed the idea of having another king. Caesar was effectively, by declaring himself a dictator for life, becoming um, a king. And they absolutely hated it. And so uh, you end up with a plot to assassinate Caesar on the Ides of March in um, 44 BC. And he's assassinated because he had the audacity to be the biggest man in Roman Republican history. But the key thing is this. His death then initiated the series of events which then brought the Republican Roman world to its end in 27 BC. What did SPQR stand for? It's very straightforward. It's basically the Senate and the people of Rome. So in the Roman Republic, things were done on behalf of the Senate and the people of Rome. Then in the Roman Empire, when you have an emperor, the conceit is the emperor as the leading man of the world of Rome was still doing things for the Senate and the people of Rome, SPQR, but he was lying because he was an emperor. But certainly in the case of the Roman Republic, it's absolutely true. Things were carried out in the name of the Senate and the people of Rome. For those who really, really, really want to know, the translation is Senatus Populusque Romanus. Next question. Was the Roman Republic ever restored? 
only in Russell Crowe's head at the end of the movie Gladiator when most of the viewing public who don't know anything about Roman history would have assumed that Derek Jacobi had become a new consul and the Roman Republic had been restored. Absolute rubbish. Apologies to Russell Crowe, huge fan, love the movie Gladiator, but the Roman Republic was never restored. If you're a Roman emperor, you're the most powerful person in your entire world. With all the power and wealth and anything else you want that goes with it. Why on earth would you give it up? So no, no Roman emperor gave up their power in that way. The Roman Republic was never restored. Was it ever close to being restored, ever? No. No, no one tried. No, not really. <laughs> and on that, on that bombshell, <laughs> I really, really hope that you've enjoyed me answering some of these uh, questions from Google, the most popular questions on the Roman Republic. If you want to see me appear in any more programming uh, dealing with the ancient world, the classical world, the world of Rome, then click on any of these videos on the screen now and I will see you all very soon.